Hello and welcome to another video. In this video I'm going to be going over the basic supplies that you need to get started with watercolor. The first material that you'll need obviously is watercolor. Watercolors come in several different forms. Here I have tubes which are all of these here. They also come in full pans which is this size and half pans so already poured into these lovely little plastic containers. Uh, now these that I'm showing you are actually tube paints that have been poured into pans and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but you can also get watercolors in liquid form, which I don't recommend getting started, but they can be really fun once you get a hang of the basics of watercolor. And they also come in a new, newer form, at least newer to me, and that is a pigment stick. And I don't actually have one in my collection, but I'll put a picture somewhere here for you to look at that. So when deciding between the different forms of watercolor, there's a couple things to keep in mind. First one is, do you want to be able to travel with these? For example, with tube paints, they're fantastic. They're my personal favorite, but you usually will have to carry all of these tubes with you and your palette, or, and this is what I do, is I will actually put my paints into a palette and let them dry and then take this with me if I'm going out to paint, traveling, moving my setup, or just at home painting. That's how I uh, prefer to use them. With pan watercolors, full or half pans, they tend to be pretty popular because they're very portable. For example, you can get palettes like these that either come with these little half pans or you can put in them. And this also gives you the flexibility to change around what colors you have in your palette at any given time, especially if your taste changes or you wanna try out a new color, or you're trying to pare down, and they're very flexible. And these types of palettes come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, the one that I have is just a small one that I use for plein air. So yeah, you have a lot of flexibility with pans. The nice thing about pigment sticks, which I will put up another picture here for you, since I don't have them to show, is that you can actually put them in a palette or a pan. In you basically just cut it off and stick it in there, let it dry and set. And I've seen a lot of people use them too. They can be very flexible. Also for mixed media work or you wanna get really bold, you can actually use the stick. They look like an oil pastel as you see in the photo here. You can actually go ahead and paint with it or draw with it and then wet it and moisten up the paint and get some really cool effects. I don't recommend them for beginners though, just because most of the brands that I've seen, at least especially the ones that I'm showing you here, tend to be a, more of a professional grade, more expensive, and especially if you're getting started, it can be a little hard to work with. So now that we know the different forms of paint, if you're just getting started, what should you buy? So here I have actually the brand that I started out with for several years, this is Reeves. Uh, Michaels carries this. Artist Loft and Dale Rowney are two other brands that are very similar to the Reeves paints. I used these for years before I upgraded to a professional grade paint. And these sets are very inexpensive. They tend to be very easy to find. I know that these tubes look different because the newer sets have a new look. That's I've had these for a couple a couple years now, just for practice paints. And these can be great. They also come with a bunch of extra colors like these, this peachy quote flesh tint, which it's just no <laughs> orange violet and stuff so it gives you a lot of colors and i'll put up the current price uh, that i found on amazon for a set similar to this set because these are super affordable for especially students if you're taking a class or you're just you're not sure if you want to really get into watercolor and you want something inexpensive to try i highly recommend these these sets will get you very far uh, when you're learning another brand that is a student grade is windsor newton cotman not the professional line, the Cotman line. And these you can get in mostly individual tubes. I believe there are some sets and they also make a pan set. So I'll put that little photos of them in here somewhere for you to look at. I have a Cotman tube of permanent rose and that's also a pretty nice affordable paint. Now I'm gonna um, go over a couple professional brands. Um, the first one I want to mention, because it is actually pretty affordable for the quality of it, are Mission Gold paints. And I believe these only come in tubes, at least from what I've found. But these are a fantastic, very bright, very vibrant watercolor, and you could easily get several of these for a decent amount of money. Another brand that I personally love and I'm obsessed with is Daniel Smith. They also make pigment sticks, so you probably saw that photo a little bit earlier. These colors are just gorgeous and amazing, and I love them. 
Another brand is another Winsor Newton brand, but this is their professional line. So there's two different tubes because this is one's older. And this is their professional artist line, very high quality pigments. And I'm actually pretty darn happy with these for the price. Another brand that you may want to look at for a little bit more of opaque watercolor that is a bit more expensive, but really worth the money if you really want to invest in a really nice set is the Holbein paints. And this is Horizon Blue. Another one is the Sennelier paints. And I actually got a starter set of this for about... I'm gonna say $45 around then and that was pretty affordable for the colors that I got so some of these professional sets are actually quite affordable and another one that actually is a really good bang for your buck depending on the pigments that you buy are the M. Graham watercolors um, and I've actually been playing a lot with these these are fantastic the downside to this specific brand that I'll mention now if you really want to go for these is that if you want to keep them in pans like this they tend to leak everywhere like this is an M. Graham one right here because these actually have a lot of honey in the binder of these so they they're very liquidy they're very gooey they're very luscious colors but they tend to be a little harder to store especially if you are using a pan and there are tons of more other watercolor brands out there those are just some ones that I wanted to highlight because they're pretty well available for most people but um, say that you you picked your brand now and now you don't know what colors to get because there are so many lovely colors in watercolor I'm gonna make it really simple for you. <laughs> I'm gonna say that all you need is a warm and cool blue, a warm and cool red, warm and cool yellow, and then I also recommend getting a couple earth tones and I have the Reeves Burnt Sienna. Highly recommend Burnt Sienna in any brand as a color in general as a neutral. And Burnt Umber, you can also use what is called a Van Dyke Brown and I don't have it physically in front of me, but I use that color a lot. And I also recommend getting a black and some watercolors are gonna really hate me for this, but when you're just starting out and you're learning to mix, having a black can really be helpful, especially if you're doing illustrative work and want outline things or you're doing like starry skies, things like that. It's just a helpful mixing color to have. You can mix very close to black or very pretty darks and really vibrant deep colors with these other colors, but I find that having a black is just really helpful. On that note as well, I also recommend having either a neutral color like Daniel Smith's Neutral Tint. Winsor Newton and a couple other brands also make this color. Or a Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray tends to be a bit bluer. It's a gorgeous color and honestly, especially when I was getting started, you can see just how this tube is just half gone, <laughs> over half gone. I use this a lot and I highly recommend it for mixing. It's just, it's a lovely color to have. But if you had to pare it down even more and say that you couldn't afford a bunch of colors, I would get the Warm and Cool of each of the primaries, a Burnt Sienna and a Black. So if you had to pare it down to eight colors, that's what I would do. If you can get 10, this is a little 10 color set, this will get you really far. And like I said, the Reeve sets and De La Rowney and the Artist Loft brand sets tend to come with other colors. You're not necessarily gonna use them as much as you think, but it's also just nice to have to play with. So a lot of these student grade sets will be very affordable and you'll be able to play with a lot more colors. Now that being said, if you are getting serious about watercolor or you think that you're gonna really love it and gonna be using it for many years, or you just want something really high quality to work with when you're learning, I highly recommend this set. And I did an unboxing and swatching of this set. This is the Daniel Smith Essential Watercolor Set. It's a split primary. So it has a warm and cool red, warm and cool yellow and a warm and cool blue and that's it there's no neutrals in this uh, but i highly highly recommend this set for a more um, professional grade starter set and these colors can get you really far and we're going to be exploring a bit more about color mixing and this set will definitely be in that feature so if you want to see what you can do with this specific set and this specific set stay tuned for some upcoming videos now i recommend that if you get a set like this that you get a burnt sienna and either neutral tint or black or both um, because the thing that this set is lacking is a neutral and black i personally like to have them uh, you can get away with most things with just these split primaries, but it's always nice to have these other colors. So I hope that helps you figure out what to buy if you're looking to invest in watercolors. So you have your watercolors, you are really excited to get started, but now you need a palette. So I've already shown this guy and I'm going to mention this guy again because this is a tin palette that uses half pans. All of the colors in here are actually from two paints that I have put in these little tiny half pans and let them dry and put them in this palette. These palettes are fantastic if you want to put your tubes or your, you know, your pre-bought pans in these palettes and move them around, rearrange them. They're easy to store, easy to travel with. This particular one is a very small set for like plein air. 
Um, and these tin palettes are actually really fun to mix on. And yeah, they're just overall really convenient, really nice. You can have it all in one and not have to worry about it. Please note that these are not airtight, so your paints may not stay moist just because it's not sealed. So that is a good option. Another one, which is another metal palette, this one's aluminum, um, that I have tube paints squeezed out in this. This palette you would have seen a lot in my videos. It's because it is my favorite palette. And these are really nice because they're a good size. You can get all different, different shapes and sizes and also has a thumb hole. So if you want to stand and paint on maybe an easel, maybe you're working with drips or something, um, th these types of palettes are really convenient for that. You can also get plastic palettes of the same similar style and this is a very inexpensive, I think I paid six bucks for this, plastic palette, which we're going to be playing with in a couple upcoming videos, that's why it's empty. Now if you want something a little more robust, I highly, highly recommend a palette like this. This is a sealable palette, um, so it has a nice little rubber gasket here and also a pull-out tray for extra mixing space. I have a, several of these palettes, actually they're the second palettes that I've ever bought for watercolor. You'll still see that it gives you plenty of space to put your tube paints in. You can even set your half pans in these little wells as well if you want to. Maybe not the most ergonomic, um, but you can do that if you have pan paint. And these palettes will keep your, your paints wet much longer. You can also take a moist sponge and put it in here and close it to keep your paints moist. For long-term storage though, I do recommend waiting until all the paints and stuff dries before storing it because any paint that's been sitting for a long time tends to get kind of kind of nasty. So we don't want mold in our paint. Another option is another plastic palette and that's a big boy like this. <laughs> And if you have watched previous videos, you would have seen me paint with and um, paint a painting of this palette. This is a Masterson Aqua Pro palette. And this gives you a ton of mixing space and a ton of wells. Um, I, as you can see, I have tons of paints in here. So if you're working at home, you're not really traveling with your paints very much, or you just, you want to work big, you need a lot of space. I highly recommend a palette like this, especially one that lets you use the lid as a mixing area as well, like this is. Um, so that's just a bigger option for you. Another option, which is very popular with a lot of artists, is using a ceramic or porcelain palette. Here I actually have a plate. <laughs> a ceramic plate that I use as a palette. I can actually pour out fresh two paints on this, let it dry, and use it as a long-term palette. Or if I know I'm gonna be using up a lot of paint, um, I can mix it as is, clean it all off when I'm done, and start fresh for the next painting. The really nice thing about porcelain and ceramic palettes is that they're just luscious to mix on, and we'll talk about that a little bit later with techniques and color mixing. Uh, these also come in tons of shapes and sizes. As I said, this is actually a, like, a serving plate, <laughs> a rectangular serving plate, and it's perfect. It works really well. They also make ones that have little wells, um, like little flower shapes, like you can get really crazy with these, and they're just really beautiful palettes. Um, just note that some of these ceramic and porcelain palettes tend to be pretty small, unless you get a big one, like the Masterson one I showed you. Um, so just keep in mind that some of them may limit your mixing space. But say you don't really have a official palette and you're just wanting to get into watercolor to play with it, um, you can take a nice white plate and just don't eat off of it. <laughs> Use it as a palette. Or go to Goodwill or another thrift shop and find a nice little white plate. So these are really can be very affordable. The downside of these is that they are fragile. Uh, they, I don't recommend traveling with these at all. They tend to be very easy to break or crack. So yeah, that's the downside of this. And the last one I want to mention is palette paper. So I actually have some watercolors here on this palette paper that is taped to a board. And this is an option for those of you that maybe have experience in oils or acrylics or even gouache. Some gouache painters use palette paper. And maybe you have some that's lying around, you're just wanting to get started, you don't want to invest in another palette or look for a plate to use, etc. And you just want to play with it. You can absolutely use palette paper as a palette. Uh, now this I am putting last just because it's not the best option because as you can see here, you can see how it's beading, how this paint beaded, this is dry now, but how this paint beaded, it's kind of hard to see because this is a gray paper. Um, you can also get white palette paper as well, but it's a little bit harder to see what you're mixing, um, how much water you have, and they tend to beat up. So it can be a little problematic that way, but it is a very nice and expensive option if you're just wanting to play with it. So the next big thing that you're gonna need um, 
uh, the next material for watercolor is obviously surfaces and in which case is mostly paper but we'll talk about a few other ones so watercolor paper comes in many forms the first one that i want to mention just because it's probably a very common one is the pad so this is just a strathmore student grade pad of paper and a watercolor paper pad is glued on the back side just like a lot of drawing pads are so you will take this off when you're done or just you can flip through it actually too pretty easily. So that is one form that you can get and you can get all different sizes, pre-cut sizes like this or larger sizes to cut down. Another form that is very popular and that I personally really like are blocks. So this is a more student grade block here. A block usually has either all four sides or in this case the top and the bottom side glued and the, the sides are open on this this brand block and then you can use a palette knife, a knife, your finger, a brush to actually peel off your painting. The downsides of blocks are that it is kind of hard to work on more than one painting unless you want to rip off the paper every time and tape it, in which case kind of defeats the purpose of a block. But these are also really nice for traveling. So if you are out plein air, I love to take these out in the field. I have another one here of a paper that I personally like. This one has all four sides gummed and these are just really nice, especially for outdoors because it's simple, you don't have to worry about taping it etc. Another form of paper that is very popular are sketchbooks and ring bound sketchbooks. This is a student grade paper that is quite affordable and they come in a bunch of sizes and each page is perforated so you can always take it off and tape it or you know move pa pages around as needed. These are really popular especially when you're getting started or keeping like a sketchbook and I actually highly recommend having at least one of these for just practicing for mixing because they're super easy to flip through. It's really nice to see your progress and then if you want to have a separate pad or loose paper or block for your finished work you can absolutely do that. Here I have a little Strathmore watercolor travel journal that I've been using as more of a swatching thing. So like you can have a lot of fun with it. I don't recommend these for finished paintings, but you know, when you're getting started, I guess it doesn't matter too much. But if you want like a finished painting that you can go and frame, I'd recommend using a, another form of Now you can also get sheets and this obviously is not a full sheet. This is one that's been cut down, but you can buy huge full sheets of watercolor paper, including professional grade cotton paper, if that's what you want to use and it's relatively affordable. The downside of getting sheets is that you have to store them, number one, and number two, you have to be able to cut them down to the size that you need. But these can be a really affordable way, actually, of getting really nice paper because a lot of the more expensive brands are, tend to be cheaper if you buy them by the sheet versus something like a pad that's pre-cut to a specific size. We've talked a lot about paper, but there are actually a couple other things that you can do um, with watercolor. And the one product that I wanna show you real quick because it's really cool are these aqua boards by ampersand um, and they have a absorbent clay-like texture on these hardboard panels so if you're familiar with acrylic oil painting you probably have worked on one of these at one point but this actually has an absorbent surface and I don't have any finished paintings on these because I haven't done anything with these yet but these can be a lot of fun another surface that you can actually make yourself using a watercolor ground now here I have the sample bottle of Daniel Smith's titanium white watercolor ground um, and this basically allows you to use this as like a paint let it dry and it'll actually make the watercolor absorb into this surface so you can actually paint on wood panels like this um, I'm pretty sure you could probably put this on glass or other things don't quote me on that <laughs> but another nice thing about watercolor ground is if you mess up a painting on paper you can actually use this to repair it or I've done like mini tears with so that's another option so these are other little tips and tricks and products that you can try um, if you don't prefer paper. Um, paper I recommend starting with, but you know, if you want to experiment and have some fun, there are plenty of other options for you to do that. So briefly, I want to explain the difference between a cotton paper and a wood pulp paper and why it is important to know the difference. The first papers I'm going to show you are the wood pulp papers. So here's a very popular brand. And um, these papers tend to be considered student grade, but I don't want that to discourage you because some artists actually prefer these papers over the cotton ones. So the wood pulp papers have more of what, oh, like a cardstocky texture. The paint will also move differently on these. So they will absorb differently, especially with watercolors because they're transparent. You'll see the differences in what a paper does with the paint. And you may prefer these papers over cotton paper. Another popular one, and I highly actually recommend these for practicing especially, are the Canton XL papers. And these are not 100% cotton, but they're still a really nice paper. 
they provide a nice smooth surface and a really smooth back side of the paper as well, so more textured on the front, smoother on the back. And these can be great for practice. I've actually used this paper a lot. You'll see, especially when you play with these, and we'll go over these in material tests in the next video, um, the differences between them and how they react differently. So some people find this surface very frustrating to do a finished piece on. I personally don't like these papers for finished work. They don't get the effect that I like, but you may find that this is perfect for you. Next, I'm going to show you some cotton paper, and this is um, a sheet that has been cut down. This is the Arches 300 pound cold press paper. This is a more expensive paper. It's really thick, as you can see, really not bendy, but this paper is absolutely luscious to work on, especially for finished pieces. It can be more affordable too when you're buying them in sheets like I do. You may not like this paper or maybe you don't want to invest in that especially when you're getting started. Another paper that I recommend that I use in almost all of my videos, guys, I know I mentioned this a lot, but this is the Arches 140 pound cold press paper. You can get a five pack of this for like 30 bucks on Blick or I think they have it on sale now for less than that. Yeah, this is a 100% cotton paper. It is more flexible, it's a little lighter, but it's just a beautiful paper to work with. Now there are tons of other brands that that have these types of papers. And actually, an, one that I do recommend is Strathmore's watercolor travel paper. And you saw the sketchbook earlier in the video, same paper. They have it in a couple different sizes. So you have a lot of options when it comes to paper. Basically, if you feel like your paper is fighting you, um, it's not gonna be fun. So out of all of the materials that I mentioned in this video, I would definitely say to invest the most in your paper. Um, for that reason because you could use the crappiest I'm not saying these are crappy I actually like these but you can use the cheapest paints in the world the cheapest brushes in the world and if you haven't but if you have a nice paper you're gonna have a lot more fun it's gonna look a lot better all right so the next material you're gonna need are brushes brushes can be a very personal preference when it comes to the size the shape the material etc but in general I'm gonna recommend that you get a few round brushes this is like the classic watercolor brush shape um, you can get these in synthetic and natural hair. The ones that I have here are synthetic. Both of these I got at Michael's actually. So I recommend having a couple rounds, a couple different sizes. As you can see, these are pretty close together in size, <laughs> but I have some smaller and some bigger ones as needed. And then I recommend playing with a flat brush. So this is what a flat brush looks like. Some can be shorter haired or longer haired, and it just creates a nice flat stroke. These are really nice to play with, especially if you want to paint buildings and things like that and get like brick texture or trees. Just a really nice brush to have. And then finally, I recommend getting a liner or script brush or rigger. Um, they have different names or different sizes and different brands. This is just a size two Zen Royal and Lang Nickel. I believe it's technically called a round but it's a little detail brush, especially if you're finishing paintings. Whiskers, hair, that kind of thing, these are really nice to have. And if you wanna play with a couple other brushes, you can get what's called a mop or quill brush, depending on the brand. And that is what this is, this is a synthetic squirrel hair. So no animals were harmed in the making of this brush. And this is a size four Raffel soft aqua brush. These are really nice for getting large washes of color large brushes and such of color. Um, they're just really fun to play with. They hold a ton of water and are just a lot of fun to get some different effects. You can also get what's called a flat wash brush. And here I have a one inch Grumbacher golden edge. They call it a stroke brush. Um, but this is just a one inch flat brush pretty much that has a synthetic fiber and can hold a lot of water and give you some really nice strokes. And we'll be playing with that in the next video as well. So yeah, I recommend getting a variety of brushes to try, see what you like. You can get large packs of inexpensive brushes as well and see what kinds that you tend to lean towards. Another brush that I do want to mention just because a lot of people really like them are these little aqua brushes. You can get these in different sizes, different shape. Essentially they have a red water reservoir right here. You will squeeze the brush to get some water out to wet your paint and mix your color. So instead of dipping into a water jar, you just squeeze your brush to get water. And these can be really nice for traveling really compact really cute and they come in a bunch of different brush tips so that's just another option that you can look into so you have paint a palette paper brushes what else do you need to get started with watercolor well you're going to need some paper towels you're also going to need a water container obviously and here i just have a small little yogurt jar and i use a lot of these because <laughs> the yogurt is delicious these make great little water jars i recommend having more than one uh, simply because you may want to keep one water jar for clean water to mix color and then one to clean up your brushes. And here I have a Talenti jar, a uh, plastic jar here. 
Um, and it, I just find it really helpful to have more than one water jar, especially when you're painting a lot and larger washes and just using a lot of paint, uh, your water tends to get dirty really quickly. Next, you're probably gonna need some tape. Now I have a artist masking tape here that I got at Michael's. You can find this at pretty much any arts and crafts store. I recommend getting more of an artist tape if you're using the tape to tape down your paper, specifically because regular painter tape and masking tape tends to rip paper, which is just a hassle and nobody wants to deal with that. Um, so I recommend getting a roll of this. They come in different colors as well. I just happen to like the natural neutral color, but you can use tape for a lot of things. You can actually use it to mask out on parts of your painting as well. You can tape edges, which is what I do. I tape my paper down and it's just, it's nice to have this. Another tool that I recommend having is a little spray bottle and you can get these really small little atomizer mister type bottles at places like Walmart, etc. And they're just really nice to have to re-wet your paints, especially if you have your paints in a palette like this where they're in pans and they have kind of sitting there dry, just give them a good spritz and then let them sit and they should be ready to go. And yeah, these are just really handy to have. Another thing that I recommend having is actually a sponge and people are gonna look at me funny for this, but I don't use this to paint per se. I use this sponge to actually wipe off excess water and paint from my brush. So instead of having to use a paper towel every single time, I save some paper towels by using a sponge, wringing it out when I'm done or rinsing it out and letting it air dry and then reusing it again. You can see that some of these sponges that I have here are pretty darn beat up. <laughs> If you watched me paint in any of my other videos, you'll notice that I use this every single time, pretty much. I also recommend getting a masking fluid. So this is a little bit fancier. Uh, masking fluid is basically like a li liquid latex. And what it does is it will actually prevent paint from touching the paper underneath of where this is placed. So you can use an applicator or an old brush and put it on your paper to mask out things like eyes, the whites of the eyes, etc. Whiskers are a really good example of this too. And this is just a really, really fun and helpful tool, especially if you tend to be a bit clumsy and you're not sure how to preserve all the white of your paper where it needs to be. So I'm just showing you a couple different brands here. Like this is the Incredible White Mask. It's called a liquid frisket, but it's the same thing. This Peebo drawing gum. I've had this, this jar forever <laughs> and it's awesome. It's also pretty affordable and it's a nice small size. And then the Windsor Newton Colorless Art Masking Fluid. And they make a colored one too that dries like yellow. So there's tons and tons of brands of this stuff, but I highly recommend it because it's been a tool that's been really fun to play with. Just keep in mind that this, this material in particular doesn't really last forever. They tend to get old and gummy after a while. Like I have this dated, this has been around too long. You can see it's kinda kinda nasty. But um, yeah, just keep that in mind that this is more of a perishable item. A couple other tools that I recommend having are a pencil and eraser. I have a black micron ink pen here. Another tool I recommend having is a pencil. Maybe you'd like to sketch your painting before you start or write notes on it, write the colors. You can do this with a pen as well. I have a black micron. And then I have a white gel pen here. This is a Uniball Signo White ink pen. And this can be really fun for finished pieces to add white highlights, say on the eyes or on the hair, a reflection. They're just an overall really nice, fun tool to have. I also recommend having a couple little binder clips. I have these cute ones here. And you can use these to clamp corners of your paper down if you're using a pad or you have a block that doesn't have all four sides gummed, um, you can do that. Or for your sketchbook as well, I just really like having these around. Another tool that I wanna mention that may be very helpful for you to have is a color wheel. So I just have a pocket color wheel here. And this basically just shows you basic color mixes. And especially when we go into color mixing and color theory, this can be a really big help to you. So I hope that gives you some good advice on what to get when getting started with watercolor. And I hope that it gets you excited to see all these beautiful and super fun supplies. If you like this video, please leave a like, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications, as well as uh, leave a comment down below if you have any other suggestions or any supplies that you consider a must have in your watercolor practice. I'm really curious if there's any additions to what I've mentioned because I know that watercolors tend to be super innovative artists. So feel free to leave that below. And as always, thank you for watching.